My name is Christian. I'm going to be building a timber frame structure that's going to serve as a proof of concept for a house I'm planning on building in a few years. We're going to start with this, to this, to this, to this. Let's get started. Today we're going to be turning the 6x8 into a tie beam for the structure. I've already prepared some similar pieces here that I won't actually be showing on video. These are pieces for the floor. Um, I'll point those out on the video at some point. Uh, you can actually see the mistake I made here. Is I started this joint at the top and I had to put this one at the bottom over here. Um, the earlier in the project you screw up, the more you can correct for it. Um, and hopefully I won't make any more mistakes like that. Uh, that's just going to change where exactly I put the, um, where I'd put that slot in some of the pieces over there behind the sawmill, um, in the posts. So over here, we've got some of these pieces here. Let's see if I, I can come around to a better angle. Hopefully you can see that a little bit better. Um, the two on the bottom are going to be on the... That's what you step on as you step into the structure and a similar one on the back. Um, it's going to be at the level of the floor. And then the one on top is a mostly finished tie beam. Um, today I'm going to be going through the whole process, start to finish, um, once you have the 6x8 that's roughly the right size. These pieces of wood are not <laughs> uniform. They're pretty close, close enough for this project, um, and this is where the centerline layout tends to shine. And I'll probably include a somewhat digital segment because it's easier to show um, how the centerline layout corrects for different problems. I'll, I'll talk about them and then either at the end of this video or in a different one show uh, more exactly what I'm talking about when I say this is how you correct for certain issues with like the beam ducking or diving or twisting, all sorts of fun stuff. Um, hopefully the wind won't be too much of a problem today. Um, but this one on top has an angle here, which will sit... So this is going to sit on a shoulder that's cut into the beam. And up here, we've got a slot which... this will sit in, this piece right here. Now I'm going to show getting this to um, actually mount in there properly at some point later on. Um, but long story short, there will be a uh, wedge of sorts, oops, sorry, a wedge of sorts going in at a diagonal, actually this way, on both sides, which will prevent this from sliding out. Then you can imagine the 6x6 six six here, and then here a uh, hole for a wedge. So the, this wedge will pull against the 6x6 six six and lock this whole piece together. That's the plan anyways. Um, the nice part about this is I don't have to waste a foot of wood or so off the end of each one of these pieces. Um, because if I were to just put a tenon on the end of all these um, and not have it be set up so that I could just slide the tenon in, that'd be another two plus feet on every single piece. Um, which, for uh, the larger the project, the more that adds up. Um, so these I've already cut. These are just a simpler version, same as the ones on the bottom. The biggest difference, and the reason I've saved the video for this one, this one also has this sword hilt mortise in it um, going all the way through. So we'll be doing that today as well. Um, but the first thing we need to do is put our layout lines on this piece. So I'm going to start on this end. Um, what we want to do is establish... We want to get this piece sitting as level this way as possible. That way when we scribe a line on one side, it's exactly in line on the other side over there. Um, 
and then we can go 90 from that. So th we'll have a plus on either side that is exactly in line. Um, and then we can snap a line along there and uh, do all of our measurements from that. And that, if there's any twist or any bows in either direction in the piece of wood, we can account for that. And I'll show that a little bit. I'm sure we'll run into that, into that a little bit with this piece. Um, so I'm gonna stop here and get set up for showing this process. All right, so the first step here is to get this as level as possible. I already know this beam is twisted a little bit. Can't really be helped, but the way we're gonna do the layout will help correct for that. So I've gone along and this face is pretty level. I'm also gonna double check a couple other faces just to see how close they are to level. That one's pretty good. So is this one. The beam is also not entirely flat, <laughs> but we can work around that. a very good example of, of how well this is going to work. Hopefully. Um, and hopefully the wind doesn't pick up too much as I'm recording. I might have to cut here and there. Um, but yeah, it's a beautiful day out, so I might as well spend it working on this stuff. So instead of putting a mark directly in the center of this, uh, I'm actually going to use this template. This template is going to tell me, well, technically it sits like this, but this is going to tell me from the bottom where the center is going to be. But I'm actually gonna move it up a little bit because I know this beam is not square and I'm gonna be taking a little bit off the bottom relative to the level center line. Um, so when I mark this on both sides, I'll mark this little shoulder and come back later and clean up that bottom, probably with a plane or the uh, um, My brain just stopped working there for a sec. With the uh, the slick, it's still it's still early in the morning. Um, so I'm gonna take pencil and mark some guest lines on you. So I want to find where exactly what what I want to be my level. So this is gonna be here on this side. And I, I just as long as I'm slightly slightly above this, I should be fine. sure whatever line I scribe is level and is just slightly above both of these marks. these two right here, that's where I want to call center. And again, using the bubble level for this. The one thing I did before anything else today is I cut off these rough scraggly ends, even on the other side. Um, I just trimmed about a quarter inch off just so we've got a nice, mostly flat region to work with here. Um, so I'm going to move on to the other side, scribe the lines and come back over here 
to show snapping it all the way across. So one thing I've also done before I started with the recording, other than cleaning this up, is I used this story pole. Um, this story pole can be used actually for three different pieces. I've got three, size, three sides marked. Um, I'm not sure how clear this is going to be, but on this end, we've got, I've got it labeled what type this is. I've labeled, uh, this is where the slot goes. This is the alt center for the template, and I'll explain that in a sec because I'll be using that on this side. Um, and then I've got the inner edge and the outer edge and the post center. So this post center um, is what I'd normally line the template up against. Unfortunately, this piece is a little bit short, so I'm going to be putting the template on the other side and flipping it over. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show that. But I've got the center marked on there and a similar set of markings on the other side. And this is all measured as close as I could get um, off of the CAD model. Um, the nice part about this is if any of my lines here are off by a little bit, it's going to be consistently different across the whole structure. And I'll also be using this when I'm doing the layout. Um, I'm pointing over there because that's where the um, structure is actually going to go. Uh, I'll be using this to mark the centers, like the, the, the center posts on the concrete uh, that I'm going to set the posts on. Um, but I set this on top. Let's wait for the wind. So I set this on top and made sure that I wouldn't be going through any major knots um, at any of these points. Uh, and I looked at, because this piece isn't exactly right, I chose my favorite part of this piece relative to these markings. So before I did any cutting, any work, I was able to go through and easily assess what the right place for all of the joinery should be for this. Um, so the next thing I'm going to do um, is just keep snapping these lines across. Um, sometimes, well, if it's windy, I'll just keep, keep going. Talk more later. So 
right now I'm using just using a chalk line. Um, ink lines work better for this, um, but it's what I have on hand. Um, I also it doesn't stain your hands quite as much, but if you're going to be outside in the rain, um, the chalk will wash off eventually. So depending on what your requirements are, um, chalk lines are probably a better bet. Oh, sorry, ink lines are probably a better bet. All right. That would, no, I actually didn't get a sample in there. Okay, so now we're snapped all the way around. The next thing I want to consider, I'm hoping you can hear me over the wind, um, is what face I want to start on. So I'm going to start by marking, and now, yeah, the wind's coming back. Alright, so now that I've got the line snapped, the next thing is to use the story pole mark along one of the faces and this face I'll then pull the lines all the way around the piece even if it's not strictly necessary it helps 
make sure everything stays in alignment. Um, and then use that to uh, align the templates and get everything set. Uh, I'm gonna, because this, well, which face do I wanna use? I think I'm gonna go with this face. Primarily because it's, um, especially on this side, I don't have to do any guesswork transferring the lines to either side. This is a nice sharp edge, that's a nice sharp edge. The other side on that corner isn't as much. So I'm going to get this in place, put the lines on, and then use a square to wrap them around. This is going to be the bottom, so I've got to make sure that I don't go anywhere past that. Okay. I'm reasonably happy with that. Double check. Center is here. And I'm not, so it looks good. That's just on the edge of a knot. That's okay. I'll work around it. Especially for the first one of these, you'll want to write what each one of these marks are. I've got it memorized, hopefully, so I'm not going to bother annotating these, but it's definitely a good thing to do when you're first starting out. That's all we need for that for now. We've got to go grab the square. I'll be right back. Ideally, I'd be using a T-square, but this works in a pinch. What's interesting is I can actually omit a good number of these lines and in further positions, either using the story pole or just with the template. Um, but I prefer to have them just because 
it keeps me consistent all the way around and if I want to double check something I've got the measurement right there to go against. I'm going to go do the same on the other side. I'm gonna pause the video. Well, yeah, I'm gonna do the same on this side just by carrying these lines down. Um, it's gonna be fairly repetitive. Once I get over to the other side, um, or maybe even the top, um, I'd like to show some of the guesstimation you can do and how to correct for that. Um, what's going to happen is, especially on that end, um, carrying the lines around is when you don't have a sharp corner, corner is guesswork. But as long as I can get consistent lines here, um, actually, I'll, sh I'll show that now. Um, change my mind. So, let the sword pull out of the way. This side is, again, is easy just because square edge. Um, I'm not doing any interpolating myself for where the line might go. But on the other end, that's a little bit iffy. So I'm going to get these to the center line a little bit fast. this end. Because this is rounded, there's, I, if I were to eyeball that, I could be off by up to an eighth of an inch, depending on how much I'm going off. But this, I know is in line with our original marks. So if I line the story pole up correctly, I can use it to bring the marks all the way down to the other side.
I almost forgot the center mark. I'll go back and do that in a second. So that problem solved. Um, I now have marks on the other side that should be exactly in line with the ones I made previously. Come back through and make sure I do the center. Here. Center is easiest to lose before you scribe just because it's floating off in the middle of a bunch of multicolored woods. Wood. going to do the same thing I did the previous time. I'll probably include a link um, somewhere on the screen to jump forward to the next segment around now. Maybe even sooner. This part can be a little bit tedious, but it's worth getting right. Because if you don't, nothing tends to line up. Also, if you can manage to get a uh, story pole that's not curved, <laughs> I highly recommend it. Um, the other one I have is not nearly as bad, but this was cut out of a piece of scrap red oak a little while back. And I didn't pin it while, while it dried, so it's a little bit squirrely. Uh, but it works.
this right here is the last face. Unfortunately, I don't really have a good reference coming all the way through. This is probably my closest one right here. So I'll probably use this to double check. Um, and by reference, I mean line coming from this side. I've had to extrapolate, a, extrapolate from this side, and I'm going to have to do the same from this side. Um, just because I can't bend my ruler or square around the curve in the wood. Um, a little bit of guesstimation here, but should be close enough. And I also know that the only pieces that need to be perfectly accurate is the line I'm going to be drawing here, and the same on the other side. As long as those line up, I'll be alright. Um, the rest can be tuned later. Um, though, the less I can manage to do that, the better. Um, so that's that. Still need to do that later. Make sure, well, I don't technically need that. I might just leave that one off. So, I'm going to do the best I can to get a nice, consistent line through here. Because I will be eyeballing the saw cut off of these lines as I go. That looks pretty good. See, this, at this point, um, I'm going far enough that I'm not comfortable with it. This little bit right here, I'm reasonably com comfortable with. Um, but these ones, I'm going three quarters of an inch, two inches here. So I'm going to go back to the same technique of using the story pole to redo the layout from our reference, which I guess is just these two lines all the way around. These two should be nearly perfect all the way around. The rest of them should be based off of that.
is all lining up quite well. I'm pretty happy with it. Okay. So, first thing I've got to do is remember which is top and what's bottom and screw that up. I think that's bottom. Yep. That's bottom, so this is top. And while I'm here, the main thing I used to remind myself of that is actually taking the tenon, set it on here. I've got the center line, well you can kind of see it here, I've got the center line marked down the bottom with it carried over a little bit on the ends. So I can set it on here and mark this while this whole piece is still contiguous. Or I start doing any, anything else to it. And this is the part where you want to double check you're doing this on the right side. Because that's how we made that mistake that I talked about earlier. Marked. That whole thing is coming out. And next thing we do is grab this template and we're going to line it up here. So I'm going to So normally, I like to put this coming off this end, but unfortunately, the uh, this beam was cut a little bit short uh, back even before I got it to the sawmill. So instead, what I'm doing is I'm going to be coming in. Let's see. So that's that. I'm going to be coming in like this and lining it up the same way. This is where uh, paying attention in geometry a decade or two ago. Definitely pays off. Alright. So I'm lining it up both this way and this way, and once I get it exactly in position, it should be lined up at four different points. So usually I only check three because if three are lined up, the fourth should be dead on. Good. That is close, but not exact. That is good enough. That lines up. This is why, even though I don't actually need this line here, I keep it on just so if it lines up here, and this is actually six by eight, um, that shows that I'm in the right spot. So now I can come back through with this aligned, and I'm actually I don't, don't even need to take anything off the bottom here. I think I will on the other side, but I'm lined up right to this center here. So that's all set. So this whole area is going to be cut off along that line. And I'm going to come to go to the other side, do the same thing, flip it over, and make the same marks. This end is easier because I can just line it up against um, this and then scribe this across, or 
Let's just grab this across. Just make uh, make the mark for where the notch is going to go. And especially in this case, just because this piece is so curved, uh, or it's, it's rounded over here, um, I'm not even going to bother putting that mark in now. I'll come back through later with the template and use that as I'm cleaning up the bottom. back to where I Same. That's enough to shave just a hair off here, but again, I'll use the template, set it up on here, and keep shaving off until this line matches up with the line we scribed across. I'm going to put it to the other side. and set up the sword hilt. I call it the hilt. I'm not sure if that's what you're supposed to call it.
theoretically it shouldn't matter, but especially at that end, it's, uh, I've got more of a line to work with. So, I could just take the saw and just start chopping at this, and hopefully I'd get the line in the right spot, but instead what I'm going to do, take a chisel, mallet, and make a starting groove for the saw. Now normally, for a saw that's not quite that big, I would just pop these in and then start cutting right in the little indentation. Because the kerf on this is so wide, I'm actually going to do that and then come back through and widen it out from a different angle. I just want to be a little bit further away. I'm leaving a little bit of extra meat on here, just in case something happens with the other end. There's, there's a million things that can go wrong when you're cutting. And the plan is to come back through in plane and use the slick to clean this up. Again, the closer you can get it, the better, but better to spend a little bit more time in cleanup than having a piece that's too short or doesn't quite fit well. wide as it needs to be. Any wider and it gives the saw room to jump around. especially to start. I want to get this as straight as I can. Sometimes I'll walk around to the other side, cut down a little bit, 
um, just to make sure that I'm keeping the saw on track, especially when it's still wobbling around, it isn't really in the kerf yet. straight on that side. Probably my best one yet. Still a little bit to take off, but I'll do that later with the slicker at the plane. So now I've got to go do the same on the other side. What I might do is try and turn this around, and see if I can do that on my own.
although not perfect, hopefully I'm in frame, are sort of what you're looking for. You've got these pieces that were separated from the sides and then dug out using a raker. I don't know how well you can see that. But, yeah, I think that's a better piece to show. But, anyways, so you know you've got your saw tuned in.
so for this, I'm putting hardly any down pressure on it and just moving it back and forth. dangerous. I'd have to make two cuts and it would be a lot noisier. This is nice to sit here, go back and forth, and eventually you're through. Now that the tent's not flying away again, um, got these cut. I want to remark, or I guess bring the lines back across uh, this face because this will help me with the next piece I'm going to do. I'm going to be cutting, well, I'm going to be putting some holes down, uh, which will serve as, or which will serve to make it easier to cut out the, um, the slot for the tent. I used to have a template for this that looked something like this, but I think I threw it away with a pile of wood chips. So I'm just going to use the actual tenon. Matches. It's going to be hard to see because this wood was what when I marked it, but that matches the lines I drew earlier when I put the tenon on top on the center line and marked down. The other thing I need to do is in the center here, I'm going to need to drill a bunch of holes for the tenon that's going to come through here. Um, and the sword hilt is going to go here, but we'll, do, we'll deal with that later.
speed, I'd mark it while I was thinking of it. So you could use a boring machine here, you could use a drill. I prefer tea augers. Um, they're a little bit slower than a boring machine. But I just I've had just better luck with them. So I've also because because I've done this quite a few times, I know how many turns to count because each turn gets you down at roughly about the same amount. Um, so I'm going to be turning this 60 to 65 times, and that'll get me down within about a quarter inch of where I want to go, and I can finish the rest up with a chisel. Um, I've lined it to the center line here, and this is just slightly smaller than what I want to uh, uh, cut it, uh, uh, cut this, cut the size of the slot as. Um, yeah, so I'm lining it up this way, so I'm sighting down this line and matching it with the auger. Uh, now, it doesn't have to be perfect, I wouldn't get set up a laser level for this or anything like that, but the closer you are here, the easier your job will be. I lost count part way through there, but I think I'm close. I can always clean it up later. As long as I don't go over, I'll, I should be fine. This I picked up at a junk shop for, I think, five, ten bucks. Um, did need some TLC. It wasn't exactly sharpened right, but it was close enough that I could fix it up um, without too much hassle. There's certain things on this you can fix and certain things you can't. The wings here need to be intact. Um, because that's what actually cuts around the side and allows these chips to come out. Um, if the actual cutting edge here wasn't filed correctly, usually you can fix that, but it can be iffy depending on the auger. Um, and the one thing that you really can't fix at all is this screw. I've got a couple of these that have bum screws on them, unless the wood is really, really soft and you're just pushing it down through, they don't really work well at all. This is probably my favorite one. Um, it works like a dream. It doesn't take hardly any effort um, once you get it going. I tend to do the front hole and the back hole together because um, that's kind of the extent of the holes I'm trying to make and then I'll do one or two holes between depending on uh, how much space there is. thinking of something else. I know I need to be down roughly about to there. If I go a little bit deep, it's not the end of the world. Right. And I think I can sneak two in the center here.
just enough. Close enough. This part is a good mix of tedious and fun, at least for me. It's usually come in on the ends, pop these chunks out. Come back through and clean this out later. Um, give myself some room to work. That's pretty, pretty clear for the first pass. Then I come in the front and then work my way back, checking with the, usually the temple, but in this case I'm just using the actual tenon. There's no substitute for a sharp chisel, and in this case, softwood.
bit, so now I can just work my way back. a little bit careful doing that because if the grain wanders one way or the other you can split a nice chunk out of the wall here. It's not four times. In this case I'm lucky the grain of the wood is actually converging this way, so I don't have to worry about that too, too much, but definitely can't get complacent. So now if I start going this way, because the grain veers off into the side, I'm going to split that off. So I better come back around to the front.
I don't want to shove this in too hard because if I crack this this way, that weakens the joint substantially. So one thing I can do is start coming into here and see where it starts to bind. I might do this. I might grab the slick this up a little bit as I go. where it's not exactly the right tool for the job. But it works remarkably well as long as you don't damage it. That's about as tight as I usually like to get it. I'm going to put it in, knock it back this way, and see where it starts bending. Bottom is clear, top on this side needs some work. Nice snug fit. Have to clear out the bottom and the back. And we're done with this piece. Well, this part of this piece. Got it that time. Side.
pretty happy with that back wall. So I'm going to come in and come right up to that line right there. I'm going to quadruple check that I can go all the way down the line using the template. All right, well, the camera cut out after that a little bit, um, but didn't really miss too much. Um, this fits pretty well. All the way back in. I'm pretty happy with that. Um, so I'm going to be doing the same exact thing on the other side. I'll spin this around and I'll show that in the video, but I'll include a link to jump forward uh, past that if you don't want, want to watch me do the same exact thing one more time. Um, yeah, and then after that we'll work on the sword joint. So same as before. Coming in, taking a look. Center. Oh, I forgot to put the marks on the front so I can't sight down this. Thing is and the center line there, the center line there. Well,
those are in. Back to here. And again, based on this right here, I actually don't want to quite go all the way down to the line. I'll get close, but I can't. So I've got to flatten this off a little bit. Um, I've got to be careful not to get um, this down too much further than where this hole is going to line up in the 6x6 six that's six going to be sitting here. And then, same thing as before. And I know I'm probably standing in front of the camera for a good bit of this. Let me do this from the other side. I can do this wrong-handed. This is left-handed for me. This is just good ambidextery practice. Okay. Probably could have gone down a little bit further, but alright. Here. A little bit close to the line. I think this will be the first one I've done left-handed. This behind, especially on this end, has plenty of resin in it, which means all my tools are going to be covered in Sticky and as annoying as it might be, it does smell wonderful.
This is the perfect to be outside doing this. It's about 73, sunny with a nice cool breeze. Let's see if that's fitting. This one's going much nicer than the previous one. I need about another 30 seconds. Way to try and catch one of these, they get a lot of inertia. Nice. Good. Quite satisfying taking these little pieces, those like pieces of paper off the side.
see how that's fitting. Ooh, that's close. Coming down the back. Center here. And work my way back to the line. Or at least close to it. One thing to note, even though I'm not wearing safety glasses, which is my own choice, not any sort of safety recommendations here, um, what I will note is when you're chopping mortises, especially like this, these tend to fly off in that direction at a pretty good clip, so if you aren't wearing safety glasses, it's one thing to watch out for. And back to the front, where I'm just going to pop this piece out. Oh, I missed it.
trimmed again, I'm only taking a little bit off here because I do not want to split this piece in half. Which, although unlikely, is possible. What's fun is I can see, even at this depth, the uh, where the auger bit stuck in. That's how nice of a finish this can leave, which is surprising for as violent of a process as it is. Normally it doesn't look this awkward, it's standing on this side of this while doing this. It's not ideal, but it's easier to see what's going on. And now, I just want to double check this. So, I don't want to go exactly to the line, but I can get a little bit closer to it. Maybe half of what's remaining. See how that fits. That's 
any at that. Close enough for now. This will dry and shrink a little bit. So this is about as tight as you could reasonably want it. So I'm pretty happy with that. Come back in a bit. All right. The next step. Now that we've got the ends pretty much finished up, minus a little bit of cleanup that'll happen when the structures closer to being actually put together is taking this out here so I've got to bore in from both sides uh, using the T auger this is probably half an inch smaller than I'd like to be using but it'll work out just fine just means a little bit more uh, picking away with a chisel and on this side you can't actually see it on this side but it's actually going to have a V notch cut out of it um, which the king post will sit in. I've got it marked on this side so I can see what I'm doing, but it's gonna be hard to see on the other side, so I'm still not, not entirely sure how I'm going to mark this side, but we'll fiddle with that one when we, when we get to it. The first part's easier, that's just clearing out this stuff. So I'm gonna step up here and start going at it. I just wanna double check this with the template. So because I don't have two really good references on this, I've only got a rough idea of uh, if I'm going to be going straight up and down. So I've offset myself from the sides, the sides a little bit so I give myself a little bit of room. And um, I'm only going to go maybe a little bit further than halfway through, um, probably up to here or so. Um, which means I don't have to count, which, mean, which also means I can talk while I'm doing this. Let's see if I actually have anything to say. Um, also, if I go off mark a little bit, like if I'm tilted this way or, or this way, um, and I dig into here, as long as it's not too far, that's okay. Um, I'm actually planning on having the inside be, I, I wouldn't call it hollow, but um, slightly more uh, paired away than what you're going to see at the top here. Which means it'll fit reasonably well. And I won't have to uh, smack on it that hard to get it in. And it's less likely to split the speed. thinking about how I'm going to put the uh, v-notch over here. I'm going to measure that from this center line because this is at a 45 degree angle for this portion of this. The v-notch in this goes deeper than I usually make it because the other piece over there bows a good amount and that bow needs to be 
corrected for. So I corrected for it on that one, which just means this one's a little bit, that correction just goes into this one a little bit. So there'll be, is in relation to the center line identical, but because one is bigger this way or straighter this way, um, it's going to be, it's, I don't want to put that, it's, um, you just, you, you'll see the correction factor on this one and not on that one. Mm, actually, I think I want to put this here. <clears throat> so it's going to be close. Not too much. Not too close. <clears throat> so I'm kind of staggering these at diagonals just because of the size of auger I have. It's not ideal, but it should work all right. Might look like a lot of work, but it's supposed to be just tedious. Probably getting close there. more on this side, then flip. These are actually quite satisfying to uh, clear out the mortise that is. Once you get the holes drilled in. I can understand the peel of a tea auger, or not the tea auger, a uh, like a bore that you sit on. I don't want to use the right, right word for it earlier. Um, Given how many holes I'm drilling here, it's really not that bad. If they had pedal powered ones, that'd be something a little bit different. I'm kind of curious if anyone ever made one that sat on it that you could sit there and pedal instead of sit sitting there going like this. Because going like this, at least for me, isn't nearly as enjoyable is just sitting up here and spinning the tea auger.
was a little close. This one may have been a little bit over the line. We'll see. Find out in 10, 15 minutes or so. I think instead of flipping it, I'm actually going to cut a slot down here because I'll want that for when I end up putting the V in there, which I'll do quite a bit later, but I at least want to have the slot in there now before I clean out all of this material here just because there's not a lot over here to measure off of. Well, even though it's been a while since the previous video where I wanted to use this. Um, I still have not gotten around to setting this. So we'll see how well this goes on its way down. There we go. Come on. I know there's still a lot of debate whether this piece on the top was an actual tooth or if it was just for holding a guard. But in a pinch it does work for helping getting this started. cut down to the center of this V here. So that's where I'm at now, that's where I need to be. You can see this was my original center, this is the corrected center because that's about how much the other beam bowed. But that's about where I want to be. I've got to come down a good bit. Let's just go to another half an inch and see how that quarter inch Close. A little bit further. Actually, what I should do is put it in this way, hopefully, not cutting myself. Spot across. That's close. Almost there. One, maybe two strokes. And before you accuse me of planning this ahead of time, I actually have never put this, put a sign like this upside down before. Last time I did this, I just guessed, and this is actually reasonably accurate compared to what I did last time. Just a little bit more. Yeah, 
think we're good. It's a little, I think I went a little bit far on that side, but because the center's crowded, it's all right. I also have to remember that that's, why am I saying I have to remember? I've got a pencil. That in there actually comes out just about right. Cool. But again, we'll come back to that later. Um, I still figure out how I'm going to figure out this angle here. Huh. More improvisation coming up. Let's flip this around. spent about a week or two back before I started recording these videos making these saw horses. And I'm glad I did. It was a pain to not get started on this stuff, but um, these are sturdy enough that I have not worried about putting any of this stuff on here. We'll see what happens when I put the giant piece of oak on. That's probably the heaviest load I'll be putting on these. Um, okay, so I've got to bring the template around and uh, pick up some stuff that I dropped. And some of the layout, we've got this line that was brought all the way around. And I just line this up with the snapped line here, which isn't super clear because I had to snap it twice. But I can live with it. Good enough. Back to uh, drilling some holes in here. I also want to line these up to how I did on the other side. So, see where those holes are. This side, this side, this side, this side. Because ideally, I'd like these to connect, um, just for the ease of cleaning this out. If I don't, that's fine. Actually, if, if they don't, I've done something horribly wrong, but they're usually off by six or yeah, sixteenth of an inch or so. And again, I'm just sighting this by. And this, actually right here, this tarot is telling me that I need to sharpen this auger slightly. This side should be quite a bit further. I went a bit deeper than I needed to on the opposite side. It's a nice day so all the neighbors are out too. Had about a week of rain and cold, blustery days.
two more and then we can start clearing out the hole. Well, so far the hole's been matching up pretty nicely. Which suggests that I didn't get things too bad on the other side. If I had to do this all again, I'd probably go with thicker trees for this. Just having pieces that are just under round for the size of being need can be a bit of a pain. As this hopefully shows, it's doable, but it's far from ideal. Which makes the layout a pain. See how well that lined up? Right in. doing here is going at the uh, thin spot between the holes so much of this you can see don't have a proper tripod setup currently just sitting on a piece of a broken ore that's been pounded into the ground which should work pretty well And I don't want to drive this all the way through, at least not yet. Are you talking to yourself? What? Are you talking to yourself? No, I'm talking to the camera. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Everybody's outside today. I went all the way through. Be a chance of blowing out the other side more than I'd like. What's up, chicken? See the so I put the chisel here and here and this is where the auger bed was going. So I'm just prying out 
these pieces. Once these are out, I'll have room to just tear down the sides and clean the whole thing out. Probably good enough for now. So now I can just come to here. Start popping some nice big pieces out. So now that I've got the majority of this cleared out, coming through here, I'm going to come through and do the corners. The easy way to do this would be with a corner chisel. I don't own one of those. And they can be a bit of a pain to sharpen. Um, I got to use one, one when I was taking uh, Mr. Pickety's class. But if you don't have one, don't sweat it. size would make this a lot easier. There's a lot of extra cruft that I've got to split out in the corners. See how much easier this corner is. This is the thin corner opposite the one that I left thick. Which is not ideal, but still a lot easier. 
Alright, this half's done. Coming back to this half. Get closer to the line, or like it's a little bit into the line. Start using the template to see if your tenon will actually fit your mortise. So I'm getting close, but I haven't gone too too far yet. I'm going to finish clearing out this corner before bringing it right down to where I need to be. separate that from the wall and split out as much as I can. Come back through and just alternate side to side. have this last little square in the corner here that needs to come out. enough for now. Time to flip it over and start cleaning it up from the other side.
Hopefully on this side you can see a little bit better what I mean by taking out the uh, area between the holes. As soon as I get down deep enough, this should punch right through into the cavity I was working on the other side. Yes, not yet. Still a good bit to go. Same thing we did last time, just coming back through, chopping out what we can, freeing up some space so we can come back through and clean it all up. And we'll come back through and take out some of this in here. doesn't have a lot of the hammer to sit on. So if not careful, it runs away on me. really looking forward to is doing this in the piece of oak I have back there because that's going to be the same piece just a little bit thicker and if, in case you couldn't tell that was sarcasm <laughs> this pine is very soft which means I can just kind of power up my way through here uh, without thinking about it too too much the oak on the other hand is going to take a bit more effort But on the plus side, it won't be as sticky and should come out in nice big chunks once I separate it. So I'm all the way through. So I've got, came in about four inches this way. So I've got to go, well, maybe three inches this way. I've got to go four to five this way. Just splitting out the sides. Especially satisfying to so get nice big chunks like that. You don't have to worry about the bottom of the hole getting all clogged up because it's already nicely spaced out.
actually do the same cleanup we did last time. I said I'm going to be a little bit careful on because I don't know that that's the right line. Um, come close to it, but I'll use the template to figure it out exactly. looking all right. I can go almost right up to it. I'm going to clean this out a little bit more on the corners before I go back to that. So I guess what I can do is use this chisel to clean this one up because I do prefer mortising with that one. So what I'm doing is I'm seeing all the places where it was rubbing internally in the socket and uh, very gently paring it off. As I said before, this is, I think I said it before, this is a old piece of elm. That I never really quite fit well in the first place. This is before I really knew what I was doing too, too much. I'm still not sure that I did, but so hopefully that's now stuck in there pretty well.
the line. So I finish this up, I'll grab the camera and bring it around show you the details of what's going on inside of here. Up from that side to this corner. But looks like it's passable for now. I can feel that there's a bunch I need to take up here. Don't even go too much further. I'm not sure if you can see it from here, but I'm actually offsetting the chisel this way just to here because I know that when I'm going to drive it in, this wood compresses by a little bit, which moves me a lot close to the line.
where, I guess only here is where we're looking all right. So I've got, a, I've got a pair down the sides quite a bit more. By quite a bit, I mean more like a 30 second inch. But at this stage, that's quite a bit more. It's like a much more fun version of coloring between the lines. If you're doing mazes or puzzles or anything like that. Checking to see where it needs to be paired next. That right there is what I'm looking for. That area there is done. So that whole half I'm happy with. Back over here. Flip it over, do a little bit more clean up on the other side, and I think we're good to cut the notch. That's looking reasonable.
Another thing to check is this dimension, which I didn't do on the other side quite yet. And there I'm good. I've got to take a little bit more off. But I'm just working my way around. Let's see how this fits. Just taking off a hair here and there. Here and then I'm good to flip, I think. Might clean up this edge a little bit more. Good.
barely fits. So at this point, I'm reasonably happy with the majority of this. I do a little bit of cleanup over here on this edge real quick, but this looks pretty good for a 2x6 come, tenon coming all the way through. So now we just have to clear this out, and unfortunately you can't see, but I have marked on the back because it's actually flat, um, the V that I want to cut. So I'm going to start with that, and then start with the front. It's really going to be something almost like that. We'll see. The reason that I cut that was so it gives me an easy place to split these little pieces off because if I had to come right down to the line and lever it up at all, I'd start levering into this here, which would not be good. That's pretty close to it. I went a little bit too aggressive on that. We'll do that on this, this side as well. So what I can do now, even though it's not entirely perfect, is I can bring this line across, which doesn't actually help me for this piece because be this coming off to that. Let's see. Do some live problem solving. That's nice and toasty, huh? So it's going to be, well, without having something the right length, it's hard to tell, but it's going to be kind of like that. I don't think that's right. Hmm. Keep fiddling with it, chipping away the stuff that I know I can.
down this far. Well, I probably shouldn't have as much. This should probably come, theoretically it should go straight across here, but depending on if the uh, six by six is oversized or not, it may overlap onto this a little bit. Um, so I probably wanted to come in about a quarter inch here, not an inch or so. I'm just following the line, my way down. And that's pretty much there. A little bit of pairing, but not much. That's right up to the line there, other than back here. A little bit. I guess what I can do is, given that this is at about that level here, it's going to be at a similar level here. So I've got to come down a little bit. And that is pretty close to perpendicular across. Again, I'm eyeballing this, which is not ideal. Actually kind of defeats the purpose of a lot of the uh, stuff I've done in other areas. But this side I know is right. This side will be close and I'll just have to do a dry fit before I put the structure together um, to make sure this actually fits. So let me it's gonna go like this. Pencil on the line here. So first. reasonably happy with that. We'll be doing a little bit of pairing on the inside of this, which I'll explain in a minute once I get this mostly figured out.
that's the worst, not the worst thing in the world, all things considered. I'll do a little bit more over here. So, the last thing that needs to be done to this mortise and sword hilt is cleaning up the inside of the hilt. What we want is the outside of the hilt to mesh exactly with the opposite, so that, that part of the tenon. So, that's going to come in, and there's going to be a lot of pressure on there. So. The wood will try and compact if at all possible. Now that's going to be end grain on this, but what will happen is if we set it up so that it's contacting here, but there's a little bit of a hollow in here, just like half a degree on the inslope here, um, when it comes together, the joint will line up beautifully, and as it compresses, um, it'll probably shrink a very, very, very small amount in compression and the more it compresses, the more surface area will be on the inside of the joint. Um, which means you get a nice, uh, you get a nice um, exterior on the joint and the inside eventually lines up better and better over time. At least that's the theory anyways. So I'm gonna look at this across. I can already tell you this side needs a lot taken off the inside. So I'm just going to come back down and a little bit of pairing, a little bit of pairing. I'm going to go too, too far. Let's see, I went too deep there. Correct for that. But I'm also coming back down to where it was supposed to be in the first place, which is about there. Bring that across. That's actually looking pretty good. This side's already in the right amount. This side's also looking pretty good. Um, up here might be problematic, but it shouldn't be too bad. Looks like I ran out of uh, space on the camera uh, back there, so hopefully I didn't miss too much. Um, most of the last bit was just paring this down, getting it reasonably close to the line that I've got here. Um, 
It's definitely not perfect. It's going to need a little bit of fine tuning once I have the tenon made. Um, but luckily that piece is pretty light, um, relatively speaking, so I can slot that in and adjust it before I actually uh, hoist this up and start putting the structure together. Um, so I've got a few more of these to make, and uh, then we'll be on to the next component. Uh, thanks for watching.